Billy Connolly, everybody, let him hear it. <laughs> the most, ex- the really most exciting pants I think in radio right now. <laughs> <laughs> you have on. <laughs> Yeah, I've got an, an ecology warning on them as well. <laughs> it's uh, the 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 Italian, I think, but I, I love those those uh, sayings they have uh, on, on foreign clothes. For the English, the English is for the English is just slightly skew with. You know? <laughs> I'll try and read it upside down. We are parasites. <laughs> Earth's parasites. We multiply rapidly and eat Mother Earth away. If Mother dies, parasites die with her. That is why we must save the Earth. A bit in the basic side. <laughs> Making a, a very strong statement with your left pant leg. I don't know. Absolutely. I, 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 I used to have a wee collection of T-shirts from Japan. <laughs> I, I would buy them. I'd see them in Japan. and, and like, 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 like smart boys, smart boys go downtown. <laughs> I used to collect crap like that. But there we go. <laughs> Yeah, and you, you didn't tell your audience who are listening that my, they're a lovely tartan. They are tartan. And you know, this, this kind of tartan is, doesn't exist in Scotland. It's, it's, it's just made up. It's just invented. <laughs> and in Scotland, that's known as Bumby tartan. I don't know what the, the history of the word Bumby is, but they call it Bumby tartan when it's not a real one. So it's almost like it's bootleg. It's just other people. Yeah, but the, but the whole tartan thing is a, is, is a mystery anyway. You right. Know? Yeah. You, you know, there's a lot of nonsense talked about <laughs> it. You know, you, you hear guys saying, "Oh, you can't wear your mother's tartan and your father's tartan, and your blah blah blah, and the family tartan." But it's all nonsense, really. The tartan originally looked like, a, or as you call it, plaid, wrongly. <laughs> 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 the plaid, the plaid is that thing that looks like a curtain hanging from the left shoulder in a pipe band. You know the thing that looks like a, a curtain dangling down. That's a plaid. And uh, but the, 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 they used to look like tweed. You know, they were tweedy materials because they were used for camouflage for hunting on the hill. And uh, I mean, if a deer saw somebody coming up there. <laughs> What the fuck is that? <laughs> With square silver buttons and be a lot of starving hunters. Yeah, and there's everybody's got. You can have your own tartan. El, there's an Elvis Presley tartan. There's every town has their own tartan. Every football team has a tartan. Some some rock bands have their own tartans. And, and there's a Pakistani guy in Dundee. There used to be a famous butterscotch maker called Keelers, and he bought them. And his name's Can K H A N. And he changed his name to McCann <laughs> he put, uh, and got himself a tartan. Yeah. Now, I didn't know about the Elvis tartan because... Oh, there's an Elvis, yeah. Yeah. No, is that something Elvis wore or... No, someone the, has just yeah. designed it and stuck it on the market. Yeah. If Elvis was still alive, this is where he'd be right now. Where yeah, is, there's sure. he'd be in a kilt. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's great to have you here and you're playing here in New York... Uh, this week, the yeah. world famous Beacon Theater. Yeah, Thursday and Friday. Thursday and Friday nights. Now, does it matter to you what kind of theater? I mean, does it does it kind of amp up a little bit? Oh, uh, with the Beacon, it does. You yeah. know, you just think of the Allman Brothers. Allman Brothers and, is all. Yeah. And Bob Dylan and Eric Clapton and people like that. They're, that's what I think of anyway. Yeah. But uh, but once the light goes out, you could be anywhere. You could, <laughs> be, in, you could be in Aberdeen. It's just a, it's the same thing. <laughs> right. But th- th- leading up to it, you're like, okay, this is one of the famous rooms. This yes. Is I want to do well. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's it, it affects you before you get there, but nothing much affects you once you get there. Mm-hmm. 
right up till dressing room time, you get you're affected and nervous and jumpy, and and, and and a terrifying thing happens when you're nervous. You forget everything. You forget. <laughs> you forget everything you got about. You thought you were about to say. Like three days ago, you had a, an idea for a smart ass <laughs> line to open with. Right. Boom. Gone. It's gone. <laughs> Just out of there. Yeah, out of there. Yeah. And then, but they go Billy Connolly, and you walk on, and and stuff starts to tumble back into your head as you walk towards the microphone. I met Paco Pena, the guitarist, the classical Spanish guitarist, and he's, I've never had a drink before a show. I've, I've often finished very bravely in <laughs> previous years, but he, I've never had a drink before a show, but he said he has one drink, he's never, and he said he's, he'd never heard his second name pronounced on the stage, or announced. <laughs> and they go, ladies and gentlemen, Paco, <laughs> he hits back the whiskey and walks on, and it settles him a bit. Yeah. Well, it's always interesting when people go, oh, I could never do that because I would be terrified. But many comics are terrified and just walk through it. Just do The it. terror is part of the deal. Yeah. I think there's a bit of, a bit of drug and uh, all sorts of addictive life that is like that. It's, sure. It's very frightening. And it's, and it's like motorcycling is hurtling along at 120 miles an hour. You, you know, you, there's, there's, a, there's a threat in it. There's an edge. And, and but but you, you, the comedy is so weird because you're walking on there to three or four thousand strangers or two hundred or eight hundred or how many of ever it is, and you and you are making a statement. I'm the funniest guy in the room, right? You know, and and uh, a lot of people are sitting there going, "My ass!" <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> There's always a, yeah. always a challenger. In, in the early yeah. days especially, but as you get more established, people come looking forward to seeing what you've got. You know, mm -hmm. they're not there to screw you up. But, but that is, you have to be able to, to lean out and say, I should be the one with a microphone. Uh, yes. No matter what. I mean, all these people are sitting here and I'll be the one who talks. And you pay attention. Absolutely, <laughs> it's kind of weird. I, I've never, I've, I've always wondered, and I talk a lot about hecklers in this show I'm doing. That, that you know, but hecklers I've known, hecklers I've hit, <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 it, and it's 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 a bizarre thing to be to sit in the dark shouting. You know, right? <laughs> it's kind of terribly cowardly thing to be. Yeah, and there's no satisfaction comes from it. But you, but I guess just the people next to you know, hey, he screamed something out. Or I think it's also you don't normally, mo like if you go to a movie, you can't get Robert De Niro's attention. But here you could make Billy Connolly look over at you. I think yeah. it's got to be the only thing for it. I guess so. Yeah. I guess so. It's, it's like going to the movies. With, with, have you ever been to a movie theater where with, with the majority are black people? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm in live in New York, so <laughs> yeah, it's pretty common. Or, and I experienced the same. I went to see a play in in Doha, in Qatar, in the Arab country, and they behave exactly the same. And I, f I find it charming and delightful. <laughs> it's like uh, it's like Shakespearean theatre. People say, "Look out behind you!" <laughs> yeah. Of course he does. He's your uncle. <laughs> Don't you speak like that to your mother? <laughs> and and you know, and you know, in Shakespearean plays, they used to stop the actor. The actors would stop and say, "You see." He doesn't know <laughs> that I am his father. Therefore, he's treating his uncle like his brother when he is his second cousin. And I mean, they do that in these Arab plays, and everybody pays attention and applauds. <laughs> <laughs> And then, then, then the baddie will walk on and go, whoa, yeah, here he comes. Because the sandwiches are and all yeah. that. And I find it delightful and refreshing compared to people sitting in their designer clothes behaving, watching it. Well, the way that the, that theater was done at first, it was to regular people, right? To, when Shakespeare happened, it was for common people. Correct? Yeah, well, some of it was for common people. The, the, there's, uh, they've built a replica of a Shakespearean theater in London, the name of which escapes me completely. And the, the audience at the front of the stage are standing up. They don't get a seat. And then there's a sort of, it looks like the Colosseum. There's rings of balconies. Uh, and they're all seated 
but the but the ones who are standing right in front of the performer are known as the stinkards <laughs> because they were smelly people. They, <laughs> they were the poor and they lived in it, and the world smelled very bad in those days. And they were the stinkards. So the it was like a Shakespearean pit, but everybody who goes up front couldn't afford to sit down. That's that right. The yeah, they had to stand there. Yeah. So front row, worst you could possibly have in those days. Like, oh shit, I hope no one sees me sitting up close. <laughs> <laughs> I need to be in the back. Oh, you know, it's know. interesting I see too with like large concerts. It's like British people are better at standing and waiting for music all day than Americans. When British people are good at waiting for things. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they baffle they baffle the whole world <laughs> with their ability to cue. <laughs> It's, it's no, it's no, it's not a brilliant thing to be good at. You don't need much practice. You don't need to learn anything. You just stand there like a lamppost. But they're tremendous. Fifteen, twenty hours at a rock concert, and they don't move, and you know they're packed in. Where yeah. in America, people are wandering all over and, and doing. Do things. you know? I always, when I see posters of of Woodstock or mm. anything remotely like it any of those and, and I see the thousands and thousands and thousands of faces I, f I look in the middle of the poster for a face just standing there <laughs> looking at it and I think what if he needs to pee right. <laughs> can't get out and if he gets out how does he get back to where he was <laughs> You know, it must be almost impossible. I haven't been to one of these festivals in years. I just thinking about. I just keep thinking about the toilets. Yeah, the toilets. They still don't have it worked out. After and it all stops these years. me. It stops yeah. me going. So it's a guy drowned in one on the Isle of Wight. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, oh my god, the death of all deaths. Yeah, that's got to be the worst. Yeah, pretty shitty way to go. Yeah, it is. <laughs> You, you started in, mu in music, right? That was how... Yes, I did. I started uh, in folk music. I wanted to be a comedian since I was a schoolboy, but I wasn't sure how you do it, you know, mm -hmm. because the world is a different place. And there was no nightclubs in Glasgow. Well, there was a couple of working men's kind of social clubs and uh, very posh ones in Edinburgh. And, and I, by that time, was very hairy. I had long hair and a big f fuzzy beard and my, my beard tended to grow out instead of down <laughs> so I, had, I looked like a gooseberry and, <laughs> and, and uh, I didn't know they, they wouldn't let me in you know they, they, there was a variety theatre the vaudeville kind of thing was still going on, but they wouldn't let me near the place <laughs> so I, I went via the folk music direction I, I played a banjo and uh, I saw Pete Seeger on television and I thought, I think I'll have a go at that. Right. That looks easy enough. And uh, <laughs> how deeply wrong I was. <laughs> and uh, then Beverly Hillbillies came along and I said, well, I'll have a go at that. And uh, that wasn't easy either. And, and uh, but, but banjo music and banjo songs tend to about, be about raccoons and... And, and rabbits stuck in hollow logs and <laughs> raccoons up trees and or people called Willie who murder the girlfriend right yeah <laughs> you know <laughs> and so it's kind of limited so but but good for introductions sure so that's how you start to just so the introduction more became more than much more important <laughs> than this than the material yeah and I couldn't help it I tried to be at some point I said I want to be good I want to be I wanted to be really good and renowned as a as a player, you know, but it never happened. I just <laughs> fell for it. I just couldn't resist laughing and carrying on. And and I I was telling somebody last night. I was in a band with a guy called Jimmy Steele, who had a, a, a unstoppable stutter. <laughs> yeah, you know, as a, do you call it a stammer or a stutter? We well, call it both, yeah. Ah, uh, well, yeah. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And. Uh, but he sang absolutely normally. He didn't stutter when he sang, and he he was a very good singer. And he was he was teaching me banjo, and and, and I but he liked playing guitar. So he he would play guitar and sing in the band, and and I would play the banjo at the back. But he insisted on 
introducing the songs. <laughs> so he would stop singing and then he'd go... Da, 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 da. <laughs> and people would all burst out laughing, thinking, how clever he, right. he's doing that stuttering stuff. He's really got it down, <laughs> you know. And, 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 and that, was, that was an agony. Oh, my God, stop, stop. And I would plead with him, please let me introduce the stuff. You know. <laughs> but he knew I was funny and he was kind of jealous and he wouldn't let me do it, you know. But eventually I just kind of took over. Sure. It. Hey, how did he feel when Roger Daltrey actually just started to stutter when he sang? That had to be kind of like, suddenly now Roger Daltrey singing My Generation. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> a guy without a stutter. I, I think Jimmy going to like, come on, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Behave. That's my act. You're yeah. running away with it. <laughs> That's not fu fu fu. <laughs> <laughs> So that was the a thing when you were getting laughs in between the songs. You're like, yeah, I'm on my way. I just well, thought of a joke. I'll have to tell you the punchline to get it out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> it's a guy called Donkey. I, I heard this joke <laughs> in the middle of Loch Lomond when I was fishing once with a guy called Digi Daily, and 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 he, he, he we called him Digi Daily. Because he, I, I don't remember his, his proper first name. <laughs> he, he, he's dead now, like most of my friends. <laughs> and, and that's the truth. The, and, uh, but he, he was really curious, and, uh, and I would say, "Oh, I was in Edinburgh last week. I did a concert." There. Oh, did you? Did you? Oh, did did you? Did you? So I called him Digi Digi Daily, and he told me this joke, and I was I've been laughing for years at it. It's like, uh, oh, what is it? Oh God, I've forgotten it. <laughs> oh, it's a man called Donkey. Two guys walk into a bar, and one guy says to the other, right, Donkey, it's my round, what do you want? And he, he's, he's and stammering, he says, two pounds, a pint, a pint, a pint of Guinness. So the guy goes up to the bar and says, two pints of Guinness, one for Donkey, one for me, thanks very much. The guy pours the drinks, gives them back. The guy scoffs, says quickly, says, come on, Donkey, get them in, it's your round. So Donkey goes up to the bar and he uh, says, two, uh, two, and the guy says, two pints again. He says, yeah, 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 yeah. The guy's pouring them and he says, you know, I think it's ridiculous the way he calls you Donkey all the time. He says, oh, he, oh, he, oh, <laughs> he always calls me that. <laughs> <laughs> It was, it was stuck in there. I had, to, I, had to, I had to dislodge it. I'm sorry. It's like having something stuck sideways up your nose. You can only, you can only last so long. And it happens on stage as well. When you're talking about things and you think of something else, you have to say it because it'll sit there like an ugly bird on a branch going, talk about me. I'm funny. Talk about me. Why aren't you talking about me? And it'll spoil the thing you're talking about. Because it's not just like going on and telling jokes. I'm sure it is for some guys. But some of us are mentally ill. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and there's a lot going on up there, you know. It's, it's kind of... You know the, the, when, when you were skipping rope when you were a kid and, the, the, and there's two people, one at each end of the rope and... And then there's another line of kids who are just sort of <laughs> moving up and down, waiting for their chance, moving along slowly in a line. Well, that's the way ideas come <laughs> <laughs> It's kind of bizarre in, in the extreme. And, and then you go to talk about it and forget about it immediately. And it's, oh, God, I've forgotten the thing I was going to tell you. I better tell you about something else. And, and I've often wondered how my, my audience cope, you know, because it's, <laughs> it's going in so many directions at the same time. Well, that's why I think people say that your show is always different, and because... It's still always different because I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> you, can't, you can't do it properly, so Absolutely. why not give in? But I do also love the fact of, okay, it's right there, I'm just going to commit to this thing and get rid of it. Yeah, yeah, and I've often, I've never ma I've never made it to the stage with with a request where someone said, "Could you mention my uncle Bobby? He's in the audience and he's ninety seven, and he loves you." <laughs> and I've often thought that God, ninety seven. I must talk about that. I've never ever <laughs> never I've happened. never remembered it yeah. ever ever because <laughs> as soon as that walk from the wings to the microphone, it changes your whole personality. Yeah. 
you know you just become this other guy but what I love is that you're remembering it now that it doesn't matter at all so it's yeah, so no consequence it's just everywhere it's all over the place it's right there now yeah. now you have it but you, you it's a transformation every night that you go out there Aye. every single night you well, feel it's not it. so much a magical transformation it's just yeah. trying to remember the stuff I did the night before and, it's, and I've, I've got this thing, keep talking to you, remember what you were talking about. <laughs> and it's never really let me down. Yeah. And it, and it can take you places you didn't want to go. <laughs> and and if, if there's any comedians out there who, there may be, I, I'm not a great giver of advice, but I stumbled on a thing some years ago. If you're on tour and, and you're doing, say you're doing a thing about a kangaroo is your first part, and you follow it by a thing about a bicycle, and you link them funnily, you know, the, the, you've got some funny way of linking the kangaroo and the bike, and as the tour's going on, you're beginning to get bored with it, and you're trying to break away from it, and, and you're not managing, because half your brain is saying, do the kangaroo <laughs> thing. You know it works. <laughs> You know they love it. Do it. Stop being adventurous. Do the thing you know it works. And you're going, shut up, shut up. I'm trying to be adventurous here. Well, what to do is reverse them. Make it so you have to get from the bicycle to the kangaroo. And just keeps the excitement level up And it for keeps you. the excitement level yeah. going. And the terror level. It's all based on terror. You don't want to be too comfortable when you're on stage. Oh, no, no, no. You want to be frightened. Yeah. You go, you go, not frightened, but you want to be curious and uh, about the audience and unaware of who they are and what's going on. I hate knowing who's in the crowd, you know. You don't want to know that there's a celebrity out there. Oh, I or, hate it. Yeah. I hate it. I start looking for them. <laughs> I'll tell you the weirdest one, Sean Connery, when he, when he's got a most distinctive laugh. Mm -hmm. You know, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> He's almost got one of those shhs in it. Oh, shh. <laughs> I don't know where he got that. Yes. <laughs> There's nobody else in Scotland. Nobody else. <laughs> <laughs> and yet we think of that as Scottish. If it's Sean Connery, that's completely Scotland to us. Yeah. yeah. And, he, he, and he's in the. He's a great wheel in the Scottish National Party. If, and he's always shouting for independence. <laughs> and he lives in the Bahamas. <laughs> Couldn't find Scotland in a taxi. <laughs> but I love him. He's yeah. a, I, I'll tell you why I love him. He calls me boy. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm 70. <laughs> yes, boy. He phones me from time to time when he's coming to New York and I say, must go for dinner. Fancy that? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'll see you later, boy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love him. Yeah. And you know Scotland what he means? Scotland adores yeah. him. They adore They would make him king in the morning. <laughs> in the morning. And when you walk into a room with Sean Connery, all the women want to be with him and the men want to be him. It, like, it can stop a room stone dead just walking in the door. And it's been like that for him for, what, 50-plus years now? Yeah. I mean, wherever he goes, that's it. You're not going to get any bigger. Yeah. yeah. That's Bond, the real Bond. Yeah, well, of course it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there is only one James Bond. I've only seen one James Bond movie. It was Doctor No. That'll do me. That'll do. I've got myself. I don't need to see another exploding helicopter. Sure. I know what they're like. Yeah. You don't need to see new Jaws with a different fish. It's Jaws. That's yeah, it. that's You're it. You're done. Yeah, it's over. Yeah. Um, and there was one where... There was an English actor uh, sliding on a cello with a, with a girl on his knees, uh, sliding down a snowy slope, and I thought, Sean would never have done that. <laughs> Sean would have slid down on the woman playing the cello. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Boy. <laughs> boy <laughs> oh boy oh yes <laughs> that was good boy and you know he means it you know he thinks I gotta give that kid a call he's over in New York I'm gonna check in on him you know that's absolutely great. Yeah. that's just fantastic um do you when this started to happen for you though as you although were although I'll tell you another yeah, thing okay. let's go <laughs> 
I got to This will be just as good. Maybe maybe this uh, sh- this is a bad thing to, to tell. Maybe Sean will smack me one in the jaw for this. But he's a big softy, and uh, he was at my house. And they, oh, sorry, the court had a of another thing. <laughs> because before he got there, we got this phone call, and he said. Uh, where the hell's your house? <laughs> I'm on, uh, I'm on fucking Mulholland Drive here. Where's your house? And I, I told him. He said, I can't, I can't get this fucking thing to work. And it was, it was, it was the, the, the satellite guidance thing in the car. I said, for fuck's sake, you're James Bond. <laughs> <laughs> But the same guy, he he was he'd been to a bar mitzvah during the day, and he'd never to been to a bar mitzvah before. It was some the son of one of his friends in Hollywood, and he, he was saying it was beautiful. You know, he said, "We we should have things like that. We we should have this passage into manhood." And halfway through the sentence, I saw his lip go, and he was nearly crying. Another time, my daughters all came. Were doing Highland dancing into the room and they with their friends and they'd learned they spent all day practicing this Highland dance with some fiddlers and things and they come diddle dee dang diddle diddle dee diddle dee diddle dum dee diddle diddle dee and they came in on their toes where with Doc Martens on <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and he again I saw his lip going you know he's he's very it's a very Scottish thing that to be close emotionally to yourself. To be that Just to be on the edge emotionally, yeah. Because yeah. the, 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 often you read about the poet and the, and the warrior in the same person. Right. Because they're quick to go in either direction. Yes. Uh, anger or yeah. sentimentality. Mm. And what is it about that Scottish temper? Where does that... Does that exist everywhere in Scotland? I mean... No, I think the Irish get most of the blame for that. Mm-hmm. But the, <laughs> Well deserved. Yeah, yeah. And uh, but we've always been good fighters, you know, because we've always rather enjoyed doing it. <laughs> you know, when they send in the jokes, that was the, the and that's the the Scots get so upset when people call Britain England. You know, Britain isn't England. England is part of Britain, and Scotland's part of it. Northern Ireland is part of it, and Wales is part of it, and. And so when they say, oh, when England won the war, you're for what? <laughs> get your jack off and we'll see who. Because <laughs> there's an old story of an old socialist walking across a field in Scotland in the Highlands. And uh, he's from Glasgow, working class guy, old left wing guy. And uh, a toff comes up and says, Excuse me, young good man, where are you going? I'm just crossing the field here," he said. "You're not allowed to cross it. This is my property. What? What? You? You own this? Yes, I do. Uh, and where did you get it? Yeah, my father gave me it. And where did he get it? If he, he fought for it, well, get your jacket off. I'll fight you. <laughs> <laughs> And then they say, no, just leave your jacket on, I'll knock you out of it. <laughs> and this could happen on any given day in Scotland. On any it, given yeah, day. Wherever you go. Yeah. It's still a way of settling things. Well, it's in, a, in the working class, it certainly is. There's, 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 there's a definite rumble attitude <laughs> and enjoying a good fight. Right. But when I first met my wife, we, 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 we'd seen several fights in, in the street, you know, with taxi drivers and people. And, <laughs> and she said, why do you walk towards fights? Because I would go, oh, look at this guy's fighting. <laughs> she, she said, that's unnatural. You're supposed to avoid violence. You seem to look forward to taking part. I said, he's only a wee guy. He's a big guy hitting a wee guy. It's your duty in life to go up and hammer him. <laughs> <laughs> so you, uh, that's like a mating call almost, eh? Oh, yeah. It's happening. A, di- a dinner bell for you. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. As soon as the little guy goes, oh, right. Oh, hello. Boys. The boys. <laughs> your, your wife is uh, a psychologist. Mm. And uh, any uh, luck with you at all? Any... Uh... <laughs> yeah. She asks me a lot of impertinent questions. Yeah. But uh, I don't think she. Uh, if she's got, if she's come to conclusions about me, she keeps them to herself. Right. Yeah. And I did some some drawing. I had an art exhibition in London, and uh, 
I thought, I wonder what she'll make of this. Because I'm not good at noses and eyes and all that. <laughs> so I, I made all my characters like aliens. They, they all looked as if they're covered in bandages. They, they all look as if they're in bondage, actually, and some of them are chained together. And I thought... <laughs> <laughs> and she would come up and look over my shoulder and go, hmm. <laughs> now, I've often wondered what she made of it, you know, but she's never let go. She's never let me know. Have you ever asked her outright? No, I don't want no, to. No, don't, don't want to know. No, because you start copying yourself. Once, you, once you've got the information, you start impersonating yourself. It's, there's no use. You know, you're best left alone to ramble on in your in, insane manner. Well, that is, I think, one of the interesting things about you. You're this guy that you can talk to anybody, just about any subject, and yet you enjoy alone time. You like... Yeah, I'm alone a lot of my life. Yeah, <clears throat> but uh, but I like company and I li and I communicate very easily, and I like people. I think people are rather nice, and but I find it easy to talk to them. And yet, you will wander off and to spend long amounts of time by yourself. Yeah, and I just I just just thinking time. I just mm -hmm. wander off. And I, what I really loathe is when people go, "Don't worry, it might never happen." <laughs> you say, I beg your pardon. <laughs> So you could smile now and again, yeah. Billy. <laughs> Shut up, you bitch. <laughs> you know, no, you don't th smile when you think. Yeah. You know. <laughs> you would actually really be an imbecile then, wouldn't yeah. you? Yeah. Just sat by yourself smiling. Yeah, absolutely. But they seem to, to think that because you're a comedian, you should be walking around the road or laughing. Right. I mean, that's crap. So there's some of the darkest people I know are comedians. Easily. And speaking of which, and the only comedians to keep them away from serial killing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and even then, some of them do uh, do both. Um, and, and all the expressions are, "Oh, you killed last night." Oh, you murdered them. It was amazing. You know, they're yeah. all very violent expressions. About yeah, and uh, and if you didn't do that, you died. That's you right. Know, right? So yeah. You either killed or you died. Absolutely, it's yeah. kind of weird, isn't it? Yeah, it's very weird. Maybe we should have your wife work on this a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you know? and, and I'll tell you, the worst thing about it is her speciality is sexuality. But she never brings her homework home. <laughs> <laughs> and and the, book, the books are impenetrable, you know. Sometimes I've often grabbed one of her books on the way to the bathroom. <laughs> and say, I'll see what can happen here. And it's but they're impenetrable, is it? Although sometimes you find... Do you know there are people who like having sex with trees? No, this, this yeah. is no. That's the... Da -da, da -da, like woodpeckers. That. That the only thing I <laughs> Maybe that's where the pecker expression comes from. <laughs> yeah, or the, and there are people who bore a wee hole in the ground and have a go with that. Wow. You know, and the, so making love to the earth. Which seems a good idea to me. Well, it would work on golf courses, I guess. Is he got 18 <laughs> chances to get lucky. <laughs> that's pretty good. I must tell Big Sean, maybe that's what's drawing him to the court. But you, you allow her to write about you. and Oh, as yeah. much as she likes, yeah. 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 When, I, when I read the... The, the book that she wrote about which I thought was terrific by the way she's done two now right that's the, right yeah um, before that I used to think Richard Pryor had the worst childhood of any comedian but I th I think you you beat him in that I think yours was a yeah but that's that's, that's only in hindsight but at the time it wasn't that bad wasn't so bad no it's the living in a slum you don't know it's a slum until you go somewhere else and it, it isn't a slum. And you say, oh, we live in a slum. Right. But he, I had a succession of, of, of awful people come my way. School teachers and people I just had uh, one after the other, you know, psychopathic assholes. Sure. Yeah, who, who, who determined to humiliate you. And I had an auntie. My mother left when I was four. And I had an aunt who brought me up who, who deeply regretted it after a while. She was single, her and her sister. And uh, took it out on me and kind of just humiliated me all the time, all, every day. And uh, then I was sexually abused by my father. And, uh, and that went on for a wee while and, and life just got more and more colourful as it went along. <laughs> and uh, so, but, so people see that as hell. 
but uh, I had I look upon my childhood as a, as a as a a nice time. Uh, not only that, I loved my father then, and I love him now. He's dead now, but I love him still. So at the time, you, this is just something that you go through because you're not that sure that other people aren't dealing with the same kind of thing. That's right. Yeah, you're on your own, and you just go on with it. And 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 later on, forgiveness is a wonderful thing, mm -hmm. and it'll, it it lifts the whole burden off your shoulders if you just forgive people for these things. And you can fig forgive dead people; it works the same, you know. And uh, you, you because you're the victim. Mm. You must always remember that. And you've been carrying this burden along with you like a rucksack full of rocks. It's time to put it down and walk away from it. And it's amazing the good that forgiveness can do you. At what age were you able to come together with the forgiveness and say, I don't... It, I was, it was comparatively recently. It was about 10 or 15 years ago. I read a wee... I was a wee pamphlet kind of book. A wee... Just a wee... You would ignore it if it was in a, book, a bookshop. The ones they keep on the counter mm -hmm. at the side there. And it said, there's, there's no such thing as hate. There's only love and fear. And uh, it, was, it was by an Irish psychologist, I think. And I, I read it and I was blown sideways by the, how basic this idea was. The other thing I learned from it, incidentally, was uh, how to treat your children like... Um, when they've been do, done something bad, you know, instead of saying, you bad girl, because I've got four girls and a boy, instead of saying, you bad girl, you say, what are you doing that for? Bad girls do that. You're a good girl. You should be doing that. And it works amazingly well. As long as you don't put the label on and them. You don't stomp them with this thing that you're this bad creature. Yeah. And there's a thing I really hate is to see on talk shows like Sally, Jesse, Raphael, and all those people. <laughs> They're all weepy, and there's, they've got some child and an adult with them, and, and they've been molested or in some way defiled. And the, the person with them will, in a weepy way, say to Sally, Jesse, or whoever it is, Sh they've ruined her life, mm -hmm. or his life. Right. And the child's sitting there <laughs> listening to adults saying that her life's fucked. Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing you do is believe it. They obviously know what they're talking about. They're adults. They're successful. They obviously know sure. exactly what position you're in. So your, your life's going to be misery from then on in. And so once you accept that, the game's up. Yeah. But, once, but if you can forgive, it's lovely. How much of that you think plays into humor? Because a lot of comedians come in with insecurities. And yeah. yeah, it's almost uh, not a bad place to start from. You know. Yeah, well, Dylan, I was, you know Dylan Moran. No, I don't. Believe He's that. an Irish comic. Com He's extremely good. I was talking to him last night about this. It was my wife's birthday last night. Well, it was her birthday today. It was at a party last night, and Dylan was there, and he he we were talking about this because because we don't dance. <laughs> <laughs> and and my because my wife does all this kush and shook and dances I've never heard of in my life and all these gay men turn up and do it with her <laughs> <laughs> these brill creamed Lotharios <laughs> leaping around the room but the he was we were talking about this uh, the dark side of things and uh, and he he reckons it's a quest for love you know he said do you feel loved. And I said, well, yeah, like my daughters and my wife and stuff like that. But, but generally, by the world, no, I'm just a guy. And it's, it's, a, it's a quest for love, acceptance, I think. Yeah. And that's almost a nightly thing that you need. Uh, yeah, it needs you don't to be, go, oh, I remember two months ago I got a lot of love from an yeah, audience. Yeah, it doesn't last <laughs> overnight. No. Yeah. You're the following day, you need to do it again. Right. Like any drug, yeah. you know what I mean? You can't leave it behind you. And it's the worst thing about comedy, you have to do it tomorrow again. Right. And you get a standing ovation, you go, Ray, let me die, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is the moment, strike me with lightning. Because if you don't, you have to look for it tomorrow again. Yeah, you go right back to it And it becomes it addictive, searching for that thing. And if you're on a tour and you get a stand in ovation on the first and second night and you don't on the third, <laughs> now there might be a perfectly good audience. <laughs> you know, they just might be raining or something when yeah, they come in. Sure. Or maybe they just paid their income tax. Or 
or their sons told them he's gay or <laughs> daughter's pregnant or something that, and, 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 and I could spread through a whole room very quickly <laughs> <laughs> and the smell of damp raincoat in Scotland <laughs> And, and it's not your fault, but you go, God, what, what went wrong tonight? You know, you, know, you know nothing went wrong, but you just keep questioning it all the time. Even though you did great for hours and hours yes. and hours. It's like they didn't come leaping out of their seat. Yeah. Well. There's no reason for a human being to stand up at the end of the concert. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's quite enough. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I got in trouble once. I was, I, when I first came to America... I was in a place called the Harp and Bard of Boston. It doesn't exist anymore. It was a restaurant, pub kind of chain of places. And it was in Norwood, Massachusetts. And it was in 1971 or 72. The, the Vietnam War was still on. And they hired me, some, some demented person, hired me as a typical Scottish folk singer. <laughs> Wrong! <laughs> and, but what they liked most was Irish stuff. And uh, and I and I don't know much Irish stuff, but I would try my best, and I would make things up and invent songs and stuff. <laughs> and, and, and and they loved the Bonnie Banks of Loch Lomond. You know, you sure. take the high road, and I'll take the low road. Well, that's all I know. <laughs> it's a chorus. So I rewrote the song. I did about four verses. <laughs> it's a total nonsense about people committing suicide, jumping off Ben Lomond into Loch Lomond, and. And there was a Scottish guy in the audience and he said, my God, you had me in tears there. It's a long time since I heard those verses. <laughs> <laughs> but they used to, they would write on, I don't know if it's a big uh, American thing, they would write requests on, on beer mats, or the, the, that, those paper beer mats, and, and, and they'd put money in it and fold it over and send it up to the stage. And I'd never seen this before. I you know, dropped the money. I went, oh, my God, there's money here. And the guy had asked for Danny Boy, and he had sent up five bucks. And I said, <laughs> I don't know why he didn't kill me on the spot. He looked as if he was going to. But I had some money in my pocket, and I said, well, I don't know Danny Boy, but I do know the chorus, so I'll give you 350 change. <laughs> I think the chorus is worth a buck fifty, and that he, he he got terribly upset. He was going to hit me because you know, he thought he was Irish, like a lot of people in Massachusetts. Yeah, they think they're Irish, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you were still doing uh, music with it up until when, like the mid seventies? So? Yeah. yeah. I actually forgot my banjo one night in Australia. It was getting bigger and bigger the talking and mm -hmm. people were getting used to it and there was getting bigger crowds and then I actually forgot my, I thought it was in the trunk of the car and it wasn't when we got there and I went on without it in Australia and it worked very well and after that I took it with me and kept it in the wings so I could see it like my old pal <laughs> and it still is my old pal you know yeah. and I because without the banjo I wouldn't be here at all you know so I, I I still feel like having it on the side I don't want to play I don't want to perform I play it most days I was playing it this morning but the I, I sometimes want to look over and see it lurking around like an old pal it is is it the same banjo all these years no or? no I've gone through many many banjos I've too like far the too Bonds. many like, like they were James Bonds I think they breed <laughs> and just every time I look I've got more more and more banjos yeah I sometimes play with Steve Martin, mm -hmm. and uh, he's, he's a genius player, I think. He's a composer. He composes for the banjo. I play much more old-timey style, you know, mm -hmm. old plonkin style, and he does that bluegrass, but we, we seem to get it together. Well, he's a phenomenal banjo player, and then always keeps even better people around so he's introducing absolutely you know he's been in here a couple of times just to talk about music and just very seriously about promoting different people with the banjo it seems to be somewhat addictive to the people that love the instrument it is it's a it's a funky little instrument it's um it's the the attraction is the sound like people play guitar to get laid basically mm -hmm. <laughs> they play the violin because their mother made them <laughs> and they play the piano because their granny insisted that one of the family did it right and they believed that they would be the life and soul of the party not knowing they were going to have their back to the party <laughs> you know they play the whole parties behind <laughs> piano players <laughs> 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 And uh, but banjo 
you either like the noise of the banjo or you don't and if you do like it you like it a lot nobody likes it a little yeah, it's not a small amount. See, I'm from the Philadelphia area, so when people play a banjo, they play with a hundred other people, and everyone's wearing feathers, and it's the mummers parade. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's how I grew up with it. And again, those things would, you know, they would almost be like feathered gangs from different parts of the city that one day all played music. Sounds like a gay thing. To yeah. Me. It's, <laughs> Slightly gay, but they're a feathered gang. <laughs> it's a feathered gang. Oh, there's that, a gang coming. It's the feathery boys. <laughs> Run, lads! It's the feathers. <laughs> it doesn't sound like something you should no, come it, from. Does it doesn't it? really at all. <laughs> uh, but for, then after that, you were always still liked by musicians, right? The, People would have you open for them when you were doing stand up. Oh, yeah. yeah. The, 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 oh, it's hellish. Yeah, it's. The, the, oh, it's horrible. I, I opened for Elton John on the Bicentennial Tour here in 1976. I opened for Elvis Costello, Dr. Hook and the Medicine Show, Horse Lips. God, they went on to great things, Horse Lips. <laughs> 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 but they used to, there was, there was always a crowd of people at the front, maybe about, you'd be playing like Madison Square Garden, and, and, and it was, you would go down okay, but there'd be a crowd of about 100, maybe 200, which doesn't really count in Madison Square Garden. Mm. But they're just going, fuck off, fuck off! <laughs> get off, you crap, get off, get off! <laughs> they hinted. Get off! Get off! And throwing stuff and frisbees coming at you. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and even in Cincinnati, one a big ball coming towards me. It was like being in a science fiction film. <laughs> this big ball it was getting nearer and nearer. I thought, Jesus, what happens when it gets to me? <laughs> Just swallow me up and carry me out the back, you know, and dump me outside. And then fr dodging frisbees and oh, gee. and then in Washington, somebody was trying to do me a favour and they, they threw me a, a smoking pipe, a brass pipe with some hash or stuff in it but it hit me in the face and I fell in my ass and I go, oh god and my eyes are full of ash and flames and it was a nightmare sure <laughs> And then uh, when I opened for Elvis Costello, I, I, I was in uh, St. Louis. And they weren't there when I got there. And I had to start myself. I just started, blah, 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 singing songs, be, trying to be funny, blah, blah, blah. And I was in a disused store. And they had a, a sort of balcony part where you could change and get dressed. And, uh, and, and, I, and I didn't even meet the band. The, the roadies were there and they got all the amplification gear ready. And Elvis and those guys actually come out of the limo with the guitars in their hands, walked in, plugged in, and walked out and left. So I never met anybody. And I'm up in the balcony in my underwear going, oh well. Bugger this. It was hellish. So how did you. Because there was no like, comedy clubs, there was no such thing. Yeah, there's no such thing until like late. 70s, early 80s, where you could actually go and perform at for yeah. people who came up. And I remember when I was doing the Bicentennial one, I read about uh, an article in the Rolling Stone, I think it was, by Tom Waits, and he was opening for somebody, I don't know, some, at some rock and roll act, and I'll never forget the expression, he said, it's a nightly exercise in terror, <laughs> and it was. It was a horrible thing to do, I'm glad people don't do that anymore. So did My you, God, no, rock bands are opening for comedians. Yeah, that's true. But did you think, okay, um, this is leading somewhere, or holy shit, how am I going to you know, go to the next spot for me? I, I didn't know if I was doing it right, but I knew it would lead someplace. Mm -hmm. uh, and I always felt that if you, if you didn't get any success in America, then you've had half a career. Right. You know, compared to... I didn't want to be one of those Scottish guys who stayed in Scotland all the time or just... Occasional forays into England and mm -hmm. do pantomime at Christmas or summer season at the seaside. That sounded like death to me, you know. By the way, that's about ninety nine point nine 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 percent of the guys that are. That's absolutely. Top, you know, people just don't get to jump over into the states. It's a very tough thing to do in comedy. That's right. Yeah, yeah. 
And so I, I felt I was on the right track. I still don't even know if I'm on the right track. <laughs> yeah, I think it's starting to work out for you. I know. <laughs> really starting to feel good about some of this. Yeah. When did you kind of know that you were really making it and connected in America where people were actually showing up to see you? I don't know if it's happened. I just this year, I think, has, has, <laughs> has felt rather jolly. Yeah. Just I was going to change my name to that guy. Really? Yeah, because that's that's the reception I used to get in the street. You know, oh, you're that guy. You're that guy. And 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 you, they say, what's your name again? And you say Billy Connolly. They say that's right. I say I know it's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I've passed the test. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> The amazing thing, no billion. And some of them think I'm John Cleese. <laughs> that's, that's a leap. That's a leap. You, that, no, I swear. I swear it's true. And it's happened to me a thousand times. And it, and it actually happened. I was with Eric Idle and it happened to me. Because <laughs> he, I'm sure he didn't really believe me. Yeah. <laughs> And he, he actually, we, we went to Loch Ness one day. He was up at my house in Scotland. And we went to Loch Ness to look for the monster. And, and there was, we were on the boat and somebody took a picture of me on this boat just looking, thinking. And he, he just wrote on it and sent it to me. What would John Cleese do? <laughs> <laughs> now, does Cleese get called Billy Connolly? Or no! That never comes up? <laughs> And I asked him once. I asked him once, and he looked quite irritated sure. by the question. Sure. You know, and he almost he looks bored at the best of times, John. But but he but he looked distinctly irritated by my question. <laughs> what? How dare you? Well, I was going to say this: that I've never heard of a funny person who doesn't think that you're really funny. Funny people have a way of saying. Uh, Connolly changed a lot and Connolly, you know... And, oh, yeah, yeah, I have a great reputation among comedians. Yeah. Which, which I treasure, for, but which I find a kind of burden as well. What, what do you mean a burden? Because when they come to see me, I think they expect me to be better than I actually am. So you think that, they, that the, the myth, the legend of Billy Connolly is bigger than what your show is now? I don't know if it's bigger, but I, I don't know. I, I, you're asking the wrong guy. Right. <laughs> yeah, but I find it a bit of a burden, you know, being this guy that they all look up to, the British well, guys. I think the, the reason why so many people who look up to you is because you have changed um, the way stand-up happens, the way that you just go out. And start talking, and it's not yeah. I think a, I changed the British stuff, but uh, but there was American that Lenny Bruce were doing it before me in America, right? But uh, I think I changed the British way of doing it because when I when I started comedy was a very racist affair, you know, and, and even the black guys were doing it, you mm. know, the black British guys were telling anti-black jokes, you know. There was a guy Charlie something I remember on 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 television. He was always doing it. Nice to be irritated by them, and 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 they were all telling jokes about their mother-in-laws and the wife, and it was all anti-women. Mm -hmm. These guys in blue, shiny mohair suits, you know, and sort of Perry Como kind of haircuts, right. just lambasting women and black guys, and it's and it, and I then along I came, and and it became different. Um. So, and nothing about that interested you, and yet you said, "I want to." Be no, funny. because I had come from the folk scene, which was all hairy people who were <laughs> much, much more aware, right, politically about the way the world actually worked. You know, they, they went on demonstrations and tried to change the place a little. You know, right. So it was almost this because uh, in this country, Carlin kind of came in the yeah. same kind of way. Like we didn't really have a Carlin before we had George Carlin. There well, it's funny. I did a, a, a program on a, a bit like this in Canada many, many years ago. And it was Elwood Glover's lunchtime date. <laughs> and, and Elwood <laughs> said to me, you remind me of George Carlin. And I said, oh, really? Who's that? And, uh, and the audience all burst out laughing, thought I was being funny. I'd never heard of George Carlin in my life. Or Bill Cosby. I'd never heard of Bill Cosby. So I ran out and got the albums, and they were LPs. Mm -hmm. 
and played them and fell about the room and thought, oh God, this is great, there's other guys doing this. And Franklin A.J., you know Franklin? Franklin A.J., yeah. 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 I well, like didn't that. he go over into uh, Australia sometime back, right? To uh, Franklin? Yeah. I did hope it? he did. Yeah, I think that he did. He was uh, on the same thing. He was always hysterical. Oh, I've always liked him. Yeah. And then uh, he came to Edinburgh and and, and, uh, and he phoned me and said, Hey, Bill, blah, 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 blah. Because I'd met him in the street once here in New York. And I said, oh, I really like your stuff. And he said, I'm in Edinburgh, I'm doing great and all that. He said, I hope you don't mind. I've mentioned your name in my uh, billboard. And I said, oh, that's great, but you should have seen it. My name is huge. It looked like a Billy Connolly concert. <laughs> <laughs> but God bless him. I think he's brilliant. Yeah. So at that time, there was so few guys doing it that you had to kind of search each other out. Unlike now, yeah. where there's this... Tons of people that you can absolutely, yeah, yeah, to seek them out in the poorer quarters where the ragged people go. <laughs> people go. It's 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 because comedy still wasn't the, the big deal that it became. It, it, it was you were still opening for acts, you know. Mm -hmm. for, but but it but it survived and it always will. And it's something that you're happy and proud with. I mean, when it comes to all the different, because you've been in big movies and small movies and, and done television, but you will always go back to stand-up or you've never really left it? I've never really left it. Yeah. I, I, it's, it's, leaving it, it never crosses my mind. I don't, I don't make big decisions like that. The, the, the decisions come along. Your agent or your manager will say, listen, but for this offer to do this, do you fancy it? Yeah, change direction, do that. But the way it's written about, it's as if you've sat down and made a conscious decision to change direction, to start acting and to start doing this. And I like doing them all. Well, and and usually if you've been in a movie for a month or six, and you're desperate to get back on it. Barry Humphrey said a great thing, you know, he plays Damien and Everage. Mm -hmm. He said... There's nothing like it. a day of publicity, talking to radio, television, and newspaper men, and being bored stiff, to, to answering the same questions again and again and again. And then you walk on stage in front of 3,000 people and say, alone at last. Mm. You know, and it sounds ridiculous to be alone. With, but yeah, you're the, lone, the, the most alone guy in the room. And for you, because you're just ready to put any of the private thoughts out there, anything that comes up, you're ready to work your material out in front of those people. Yeah. And I don't understand guys who say, I'm, I'm, I'm doing little clubs to work out my stuff. You know, I, I just blurt it out. <laughs> <laughs> just blurt it out. Yeah. And do you have some faith that if you've thought it, it's going to be funny? Or do you think... I'll oh, you have part? to have that yeah. from day one. Right, that has to be you know foremost in your mind that if you, if you think it, it's going to be funny, and if it isn't, you, you've got enough ammunition to come charging in behind it with something else. You feel brave enough because no matter what happens, you can get them back. Yeah, just yeah. talk, just keep talking, just keep talking, and never give up. Yeah, I love the idea of it, uh, and I'm glad. And that people are sometimes get irritated by the way I laugh on stage at things I say, but I'm hearing some of them for the first time. <laughs> this, this, is, this is the man with the best possible seats to the Billy Connolly show. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Billy Connolly. Thank you so much, my friend. I'm going to watch to see if they stand for you. That's what I'm looking for. Thank you very much.